Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and the Injury Foundation are excited to have you join our live webinar series where we talk about ocean science and technology and speak with te technology experts. In this monthly series, we dive into all things marine science. We explore what's happening in the field, interesting careers, and more. And today we'll be speaking with Dr. Robert Ellis of the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission about Goliath Grouper. So before we turn things over to him, we want to tell you quickly a little bit about our programs. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. And our mission of CEFS is to engage K-12 Florida teachers and students in cutting edge research by providing science, science role models and experiences like today. So we hope that we inspire future stewards of our planet by doing so. The Njeri Foundation, is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. And many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve their 65 foot research vessel, the RV Anjari. So in case you missed any of the information in today's previous slide, we just wanna remind you that you can ask questions and submit those questions for our scientists by typing them in the chat box at any time. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over and introduce you to Dr. Bob Ellis. Dr. Ellis, we will uh, stop share and let you resume from here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for showing up today and uh, Hopefully, um, hopefully you learned something today about uh, the Goliath Grouper. Um, <clears throat> I was asked to uh, give a brief introduction about myself um, first. So oh, assuming that I can actually, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I work currently for uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife. I work at the Research Institute headquarters in St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, but before that, I actually grew up in Southern California. Um, I grew up just outside of LA in Long Beach, California. Um, and uh, when I decided to go to college, I went just up the road to UC Santa Barbara. Um, I majored there in aquatic biology, um, which was basically um, marine biology, except we learned about lakes and rivers as well. So they call it aquatic biology because it's everything wet. Um, after that, I took a couple of years off um, uh, to travel and surf and fish and have a good time. And then I decided that I wanted to, to, uh, go back to school and, and learn a little bit more about fisheries management. So, uh, I did a master's degree in, um, oceanography from, uh, Louisiana State University. And as soon as I was done with that, I moved over to Florida State where I did my PhD. Um, after I graduated from there, I went to, uh, to Washington, D.C. to work for NOAA for a year as a Canals Fellow. Um, and then as soon as that was done, I got a job back here in Florida um, working for FWC. And I work in a group called the Marine Fishery Fisheries Biology Section within FWRI, or the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. And our job is really to investigate and study life history of fish. So that is everything from the things that they eat, um, how fast they grow, where they live, the types of habitats that they like to live in. And a lot of what we do is actually related to movement ecology or where fish move and how and what forces, what kind of environmental factors make them move. And I'll talk a little bit about how we study those things um, as we get into the talk. Um, so just a quick outline of what I want to talk today about. Um, there's a ton of great information that we know about this species, the Goliath grouper. Um, and I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through things. But it, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to get to them at the end. Um, but briefly, I just want to talk a little bit about their life history. That's what I study. That's what our, our group is focused on. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about what reef fish life cycles look like. Talk about what we know about age and growth of Goliath grouper, what they eat, and then something about their population status. So um, this, this species is pretty iconic for Florida, and um, the management of it has been is tricky. Um, <clears throat> we do know that uh, historically they've been severely de depleted, and their harvest is actually closed. You can't keep a Goliath grouper. Um, 
And that has been the case since 1990. Uh, and that was that's pretty that's a pretty extreme measure that we take in fisheries management and there has been some recovery of the species but it's challenging to to figure out exactly how much they've recovered so i'll talk a little bit about that as well at the end so okay goliath grouper have a very typical reef fish lifestyle uh life cycle rather <laughs> um basically you have adults that live offshore um Goliath grouper love high relief reefs. So they love things like artificial reefs and shipwrecks, anything that, that where there's structure that they can kind of uh, either get inside of or maybe behind in kind of a, a current shadow. They love anything that is sticks up off the bottom. And that's where you'll find the adults. Um, and they spawn in the fall around the new moon of August and September. We know this because we can actually hear, we put down hydrophones and we can hear uh, booms. We call them, they, they actually communicate with each other. And the days around those new moons, you see those, the amount of noise production in the middle of the night go, goes super duper high. And that's communication between adults getting ready to spawn. So they spawn, the males and females eject their gametes into the water. And then those larvae, um, drift in the plankton for about 30 days before they settle inshore. Their primary habitat inshore is mangroves. They love to live around mangrove roots. And they live in these inshore mangrove habitats for five to six years before they grow large enough to move back out to the reef. Um, so I mentioned that this is a really typical life, life cycle for a lot of reef fish where you have kind of an inshore period where the little little guys are living and then as they grow up then they move offshore to the to the reefs um, where they spawn as adults and that's that's typically more or less what goliath grouper do um <clears throat> i mentioned acoustic telemetry this is a really important tool that we use um, to detect where fish are moving um <clears throat> we know a lot about where goliath groupers are throughout their life span um basically just from you know, from fishing, we know that you get smaller ones inshore. And then if you go out to bigger reefs offshore um, <clears throat> from fishers and, and divers, we know that that's where you typically find the adults. But if we want to know a little bit more about this and some more detail, we can use acoustic telemetry. So to do this, we'll take a panger tag like the one on the screen there and we'll implant it in the fish. And that's what's going on in that picture. We cut a very small incision. We actually put that tag inside the body cavity of the fish and we sew it back up using a stitch, just like you might get if you hurt yourself and have to go to the ER. And then that fish will swim around and that tag will ping. And every time it swims by one of these receivers that's there in the middle, um, that receiver will detect that ping and it will record it. And then we can go back and, and pick up those receivers and we can find out which fish were there at what time. And so this gives us really good information about where they move to. And we re recently finished a study where we tagged 50 adult Goliath groupers back in 2010. We started and we tagged them all when they were in the spawning aggregations. So these are adult fish. They were at clumped together at the spawning aggregations right off offshore of Jupiter, Florida, off the East Coast. And then we listened to them for the next 10 years. We detected 7 million detections from those 50 animals, and we found that they moved all the way up the coast from about West Palm Beach um, <clears throat> all the way up to Southern Georgia, um, which was a lot longer, much more of a larger range than we expected. Um, but the cool thing is we saw that 88, 81 to 94%, so almost every fish we tagged came back to the same place every fall, back to that same spawning aggregation. So these things have very predictable migration patterns um, that we can learn about using this acoustic telemetry technology. Um, moving right along, I know that there, there's, I could talk about that probably for another hour, but I want to get to more of the cool stuff about Goliath Gruber. So these are, um, obviously Goliath Gruber get very big. The, they can get up to two meters, even larger than that, um, three, four, 500 pounds. They, they're the largest reef fish in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. Um, and they grow a long time. They can live a long time. The oldest fish that's ever been aged was 37, but we think that they probably get much older than that. We caught that, that 37 year old was caught just before they closed all the harvest in 1990. So that population had already been depleted a lot. 
um, probably a lot of the big old ones had already been removed from the population. So even looking at a, at a smaller population of fish, we caught a 37 year old. That's really old for a fish. Um, again, we know that they live inshore from zero to six years. And we also know that they mature around 150 centimeters when they grow about that big, which takes them about eight to 10 years. Um, I kind of switched back and forth there between size and age. Um, this is a tricky thing for a fish biologist because if you look here at this table, you can see these are these are about a thousand fish that were aged um, using uh, a cut uh, using one of their fin rays. So one of their dorsal part of their dorsal fin, we removed it and we actually looked at a cross section and, and were able to age it. And um, just looking at the four year olds, they ranged from ten inches to three feet long. So that's a huge range, and that kind of means that you can't just rely on length to know how old a fish is. So how do we know how old they are, and how do we know how they grow? Well, what we can do is we use something called an otolith or an ear bone, um, <clears throat> and this is the typical way that most fish get aged. And you can see there on the top right of the screen, that's an otolith, and we take, it's a small bone, we remove it from the head of a fish, um, and we can make a cross section of it. And then you can just simply count the rings. And that's a seven year old, I believe, if you count the number of blue dots um, right there in that picture. Now, unfortunately to get an otolith out of a fish, you, the fish has to be dead. And so one thing that we've done over the past uh, decade or so is that every time we get a report of a dead Goliath grouper, um, we try to go and collect as much information from that fish as we can. And one thing we do is we take the O list. So you can see um, on that picture in the bottom left is that was after the 2010 cold snap. A lot of Goliath groupers died during that event. We were able to collect as many as we could and remove all those otoliths to get age information. And then in 2018, there was a bad red tide here in Southwest Florida. And we were able to collect some fish from that as well. And that's what that middle picture is. It's not a very glamorous part of our job, but it's something that needs to be done. And then once we have the otoliths and then we take the spines and rays, we can, we can make sure that the spine will tell us the same information. So basically we take, we take the spine, we cut a little part off the bottom, we look at it under a slide and you can see that the, you can see those rings are a little bit harder to see, but we have seven rings that match the otolith above. So now we have a way that we could get age information from this fish without killing it. Um, <clears throat> Goliath grouper diet. This is important to know. We wanna know what fish eats um, and Goliath grouper love to eat crabs. They love crustaceans. It's the main part of their diet when they're juveniles. About 70% of their diet that we've looked at was, was crustaceans of some kind. Um, this study here, the big pie chart on the right hand side is from about 200 juveniles taken from the 10,000 islands, which is an area near the Everglades in Southwest Florida. Um, you can see that that showed about 60 to 70% crabs and about 30% fish. Um, adults, fewer, fewer crabs, more fish, still lots of crustaceans. Um, and then when you zoom in on the fish themselves, they're not typically things that we think of um, like fish that we like to go out and fish for. So only about 1% of the adults that we looked at. And so, and that's, that's about 500 adults had, um, had fish about half of their diet was fish, but only 1% of those fish were grouper and snapper. Um, another thing to point out is that in that study of the adult diets, 12% of the things, 12% of what we pulled out of their stomachs was fishing tackle. How do we know what they eat? Well, we use manual lavage. Uh, basically, we uh, put on a glove and uh, use a piece of PVC pipe to hold their mouth open and you reach in and you actually pull out everything that you can feel in their stomach. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit invasive, but it happens very quick. And then we get a really good idea of what, what they ate. Then later on, we can take a sample of their muscle and we can verify that what, they're, what we're pulling out of the stomach is just a snapshot of what they ate that day. We can compare that to the stable isotopes, which is a record of what they eat over time in the muscle or different organs and verify that what we're seeing really is what they eat. And that is the case that they mostly eat crustaceans throughout their life. Um, 
So uh, I'm already running out of time and I wish I could talk more about some of the cool science that we do, but I did want to address some common misconceptions about Goliath Cooper. Um, this is a, like I said, this is a pretty iconic species here in Florida. Um, they used to be very abundant and it used to be part of a big fishery that you could go and catch a giant Goliath Grouper right from offshore. Uh, I mean, there's, there are hundreds of historic pictures of people with an enormous fish hanging up, but unfortunately, um, all of that fishing pressure really depleted the population down to by the, by the late eighties, um, it was about 5% or less of what the population was before we started fishing. And that is just far too low for any f more fishing pressure to go on. And so they had to close the, they, they decided to close the fishery in 1990 completely. And then you see that over time, I'm looking at the bottom left here. Um, this is a, 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 a reconstruction of the population um, done by the stock assessment. And you can see that after 1990, it took almost 20 years for the population really to start increasing again. That dotted uh, horizontal line is kind of our target. That's where we want to be. So we know that the population grew and then it kind of tapered off a little bit. And we think that that might have had to do with some of those mortality events that I mentioned, that cold snap in 2010. Um, there's also a lot of fishing pressure that goes on with the, with the species. Lots of people like to go out and fish for them recreationally. It's fun to catch a fish that's bigger than you. Um, but you know, when we catch a fish, even if we release it and we don't keep it, um, not all of them survive. And so those things add up. And what we can see is looking at the right-hand side, these are some, this is actual data. This is looking at, these are indices of abundance. Um, that we can develop to try to track the population. And you can see that they match the predictions from the stock assessment where we had a peak in the 2010s um, and then it's kind of leveled off since then. So this idea that there are just too many Goliath groupers is really not supported by any of the science that we have. Um, if anything, there are not enough. Um, <clears throat> another common thing that we hear a lot of scientists is that they eat everything on the reef. So I already showed those, those slides showing the diet um, <clears throat> that they do eat fish, but the fish that they, they eat tend to be slow, things like bird, birdfish and toe, uh, toadfish. They love to eat small stingrays. They're not eating groupers and snappers. So we can know that we can know that they don't eat everything on the reef, one, by looking at what the actually looking at their diets, but two, we can also look at the other things on the reef. And there's been two studies. Um, one published in 2011 that found that on the bottom left there that as you as you go to a reef, the number of Goliath groupers increases, so does the number of fish that you see. And as the number of Goliath groupers increases, the abundance of snappers increases as well. Um, a more recent study that is about to be published showed no effect whatsoever on the number of Goliath groupers compared to the density or the diversity of reef fish on that reef. And so when you hear that there are too many of them and they eat everything, then people start saying that we need to thin the herd. But really, this is not something that we want to necessarily jump into because there's a there's a lot of reasons. Think about that population trend. We stopped the population and we stopped fishing in 1990 and it took almost 20 years to really see growth in this population. And there's a lot of reasons why we think that um, population recovery for this species is, is going to be really slow no matter what. One is that their juvenile habitat is mangroves. And in South Florida, we can see in our major estuaries that we're tr we generally are losing mangroves. Um, <clears throat> this graph in the middle shows Tampa Bay, the Indian River Lagoon, and Charlotte Harbor, three major estuaries in Florida, all showing a decline in the amount of mangrove cover over time. So there's less juvenile habitat. They're slow to mature. It takes them 10 years before they're really out there reproducing in those spawning aggregations. And they're susceptible to mortality events that don't have to do with fishing. So red tides and cold snaps and potentially bycatch mortality as well. These are sources of mortality that aren't related to fishing that may be keeping the population down. And like I said, people are fishing for them anyway. We found that 12% of the diet of the diet, not really, they're not really eating it, but 12% of the stuff that we pulled out of those stomachs was fishing tap. So people are fishing for them anyway. You can catch and release these guys. Um, it Again, it's fun to do. I'm a fisherman myself and I love to catch Goliath grouper. 
Um, but it is something that we need to to consider about whether or not we continue to uh, we reopen the harvest for them. Um, at that point, um, it's been at over 15 minutes, so I'm going to stop there and um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm sure people have some uh, been seeing the number in the chat go up. So. Yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellis. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Um, as you mentioned, there are quite a bit of questions already, so we are going to transition to a question and answer portion of today's Ocean Expert Exchange. So I think our attendees got the trend. However, if anyone else has any questions, please type in the chat box and I'll go ahead and ask on your behalf. Our first question, we're going to start with Anna who asks, um, well, she knows that in some fish, you could tell age by rings on the scales. And it's wondering if that is possible with grouper as well. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know that we've looked at the scales for Goliath grouper. Um, we have looked at some of the... Um, I, I actually don't know about the scales. Um, I know that we've looked at the dorsal fin rays, which is if you look, actually look at that picture with the diver um, behind it. Um, well, that's me, but you mm -hmm. can see, so they have, uh, they kind of have a two part dorsal fin, right? Where the part, it's actually kind of laying down in front where I'm moving the mouse. Um, those are actually spines um, and they're very hard. Um, and they're shorter than the fin rays. And the part of the dorsal fin that's sticking up in the back is the fin rays. And um, a recent study just looked to compare those two, um, looking at fin rays and the spines, and found that spines worked a little bit better than the fin rays did um, at, for capturing that, those, that age information. So um, we can't use uh, scales for Goliath grouper, but we can use some other parts that we can take without uh, killing the fish. Thank you. Next, we have Jessica, who's wondering if Goliath grouper need to be a certain size before you can equip them with an acoustic tag. Oh, good question. Um, so we actually, the company that we work with, uh, uh, most of the acoustic telemetry companies actually uh, manufacture tags of all different sizes. And so what we do is we use a kind of a, uh, we use a 2% um, rule where the tag has to be less than 2% of the body weight of the fish. So for an adult Goliath grouper, I could put a huge tag in it, right? A 200 pound Goliath grouper could handle a four pound tag. That's, you know, not even close to what, what they, what, what the tags we use are. Um, uh, the ones that we use for the adult Goliath groupers are about, they're a little bit bigger than um, a double A battery. Imagine a double A battery, like two double A batteries put together, like end to end. Um, that's about how big that tag is. And those pinged for eight years. Um, and then, but then for smaller ones, we just use a smaller tag um, <clears throat> and you don't get as long out of them, um, but you can, you know, they're small enough that you can put them in into the Goliath groupers. So the one that I showed there was one of the bigger ones that would go in an adult, but we can also tag the smaller ones just by using smaller tags. Interesting. Thank you. Angela asks, how long Goliath grouper can stay out of the water? Oh, good question. Um, well, most fish can stay out of the water for, you know, a minute or two, I would say, without really anything ha bad happening to them. Um, if you notice, well, there was one, I only really put one picture in here, I think, about where we're actively um, studying the animal. One of the things that we always do and one of the pieces of equipment we always have with us is a way to aerate the gills with fresh water, uh, fresh salt water. But um, so on the boat that we were using um, in that case to, to tag the adults, we had a, a pump. The, the boat was fitted up with a pump and we used a garden hose and would put it, someone's job to hold the garden hose and make sure that that fresh salt, fresh seawater was continuously flowing over the gills so that we weren't stressing out the animal too much. Um, with the Goliath grouper, because they get so big, generally the advice is um, if you are struggling to pick it up out of the water, you should leave it in the water. So I would say anything, you know, smaller than like your arm is probably okay to pick up, take a picture, take the hook out and put it back in. 
Um, anything bigger than that, you really want to leave it in the water so that you're not injuring the fish. And if, and one of the things that we, a uh, piece of equipment that we actually built ourselves to study the adults was a stretcher that we would actually, um, so we could actually hold the animal down. Um, <clears throat> and so that it wouldn't move around too much. And it was stable while we were working on it, um, before we got it back in the water. Thank you. Jeff asks if there is an estimate of their population during their spawning off Palm Beach County. Yeah, so um, Southeast Florida, uh, any, you know, from Palm Beach up to through Martin County, um, and now even a little bit further north, north of that up to about Fort Pierce area is a really uh, important spawning irrigation zone, uh, spawning zone for the, these fish. Um, and one of the really neat things about this species is that they aggregate. So they form big groups to, to spawn. Um, and uh, there are tons of dive operators that, that work in that area. And some of them have been conducting their own counts over the past few years um, because it's a really cool dive experience. It's amazing to swim with you know 50 to 100 fish that are bigger than you. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of people like to come from all over the world to do it. And so some of those dive operations have been con conducting their own research. Um, <clears throat> there's another uh, program that's run by Sea Grant called the Great Goliath Grouper Count. Um, they That's a really important survey that happens every year in June, which is actually a little bit before they start grouping up. Um, <clears throat> but that gives us a really good idea of kind of the spread of Goliath Grouper throughout the state. Um, and so there are a number of different ways that we're trying to to assess the population um, <clears throat> using things like divers um, and uh, sort of more like citizen science initiatives. Uh, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation or Reef Foundation does diver surveys that are very uh, important and helpful uh, to get at that information as well. Great, thank you. John asks if you know of any supports for Goliath grouper populations in other parts of their range, for example, are there rules in the Caribbean? Yeah, so um, this species used to be distributed all through the Gulf of Mexico, down through the Caribbean, all the way down into Brazil. Um, I know that now um, the population, you know, we're not the only place that experienced that rapid, you know, very extreme population decline. Um, and there are many countries where the, there just aren't Goliath groupers anymore. However, places like Belize has a really uh, large and um, very uh, well-managed system of marine protected areas, and they've seen some population recovery there. I know that Brazil does a lot of work um, working with people to try to better understand the Goliath grouper populations in Brazil, um, <clears throat> where you, know, you could have one of the problems in parts of the Caribbean is that you can outlaw fishing for these things, but but there are lots of people that still rely on fishing for subsistence. They need, they eat fish regularly and they that's how they feed their families. And so getting the message out that, hey, look, don't eat this species is often difficult in those communities. Um, and so the conservation efforts in different places in the Caribbean look very different than the way, the way that we work on them here. Um, but we do work with those people too. Uh, I had, um, we had, a, when I was a grad student at Florida State, we had someone from Brazil come and stay with us for a whole year to learn about what we did. And he brought all that knowledge home. And then that's really developed this, helped develop this really impactful program in Brazil um, to conserve the Goliath grouper. So yes, they they are in other countries, um, but those places have challenges just like we do. And sometimes they're very different challenges than ours. Sure. Uh, Angie would like to know at what depth they usually spend most of their time or if that varies. It varies. It does vary. Um, the Most of the places where we uh, find them, um, for example, I live in St. Petersburg, so Tampa Bay. When we go out to study the Goliath groupers here, we don't see very many inside of, I would say, about 40 feet depth. Um, but once we get out to 60, 80, 90 feet, then that those those artificial reefs, those shipwrecks that we dive on there, they they tend to have a few uh, tend to have more of them. Um, when they go to aggregate to spawn, they seem to really like that range about 70 to 100 feet. Um, so any shipwreck in that depth 
zone um, is probably in anywhere in South Florida probably will have a handful to even more Goliath groupers on it. Okay, thank you. Anna notes that mangroves are slowly moving north and are being found as far north as North Carolina. Do you know if grouper are moving moving north as well? That is a very good question and a great observation as well. So yes, mangroves are um are, do are are moving north um as winters warm up. Um <clears throat> due to climate change, the those mangroves are able to persist in places where even 10 years ago they would get frozen out every winter. Um and that gives us a little bit of hope actually. You know, we've seen a pretty significant mangrove loss in some of our urbanized estuaries, places like Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, and the Indian River Lagoon have lost a lot of mangroves, but there's other places where mangroves are growing and increasing. Um, and so as long as, you know, there's supply, as long as those spawning aggregations are able to keep persisting, um, you know, it's a little bit of a hopeful sign for that maybe some of those babies will uh, show up at a brand new mangrove, you know, who knows in St. Augustine or something like that, and then be able to grow, um, into an adult. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag and it's difficult to predict which, you know, kind of which way that trend is going to go in the future. Sure. Nicholas would like to know if ocean acidification is affecting the Goliath grouper, or at least the prey that the fish eat. Great question. So we don't have any evidence that ocean acidification is a problem or an issue for Goliath grouper. Um, however, one of the things, one of the groups uh, or um, one of the animals that we suspect is going to be susceptible to ocean acidification are is anything that makes a calcium carbonate skeleton, right? And so those include things like uh, bivalves, but it could also include some crustaceans. So anything that eats any fish or predator that eats hard things in the ocean, that is going to be a concern down the road um, if ocean acidification continues to happen. Um, <clears throat> presently, we don't have any evidence that any of that is occurring, um, but we don't, it, it's something that we definitely, you know, are aware of um, that it could in the future. I, I would say one thing for Goliath groupers is that they have a very broad diet. You know, we pull a lot of different things out of their stomachs um, and they're also opportunistic feeders. Um, they don't, they're not really out there looking for specific food. Um, they're eating the things that are abundant. So if a Goliath grouper in the Keys might mostly eat lobsters Whereas a Goliath grouper growing up in a mangrove might be eating mostly blue crabs or mud crabs, right? Um, and so as they move through their life, they're eating those things that are easy to catch and, and abundant. Um, and so that gives us a little bit of hope if one if certain species are very susceptible to things like climate change or ocean acidification, that we think that the Goliath grouper is probably going to be able to just find something else to eat. Um, but Currently, we don't really have any evidence that these things are, are occurring just quite yet in this population. So in that respect, Alex has asked if Goliath groupers are less resistant to environmental change compared to other species of grouper. Hmm. I would, I would suspect that Goliath grouper, because they have a really broad range, right? And it, when we think about where they used to be before we started really fishing them, um, we have reports from them grow, going from North Carolina all the way down through the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, all the way down to Brazil. And things, species that tend to have very large ranges like that, they have, they're generalists in terms of their diet. They eat lots of different things. Those things are probably going to be more resistant um, to to major ch to big changes in in the ecosystem. The one caveat being that these things are susceptible to things like red tides um, and and cold snaps. Um, we saw in 2010 that like a very very significant decline in you know that we could even see in the adult pop in the adult population a few years later from just a couple days of freezing 
cold weather in South Florida. And so, you know, if those things become more frequent, then perhaps we might have a problem where this part of the range becomes less, um, you know, becomes wor a worse place for a Goliath grouper to live. But at the same time, there's probably another area of their range where it's going to become better for them. And so I would actually think that Goliath groupers are probably pretty resilient to things like that. As long as we have enough places where they can live, um, you know, we don't cut down all of the mangroves and we don't fish out all of the big adults. Then I think that this, this species has a decent chance of persisting. Thank you. Next up, we have Angie, who's wondering if you're aware of any disease outbreaks for the Goliath grouper that may have affected population numbers. So I'm not. Um, I, I wonder if this question is hinting at some of the stuff that's happening in the Florida Keys right now. Um, there's been a few events. Uh, there's been an ongoing event um, where there's kind of this uh, mystery spinning condition that's happening to some fish. Um, including Goliath grouper. It, it has affected Goliath grouper. We have some evidence, we have had reports of Goliath that are, that are um, exhibiting these odd behaviors. Um, we still don't know exactly what it is that's driving that. Um, but aside from sort of localized issues like that, um, there isn't really nothing really that we can, that we would point to, to, to be concerned about um, with the species. Sure. They do. Um, one thing I will say about them is that they, because of the, the way that they eat, which is relatively low on the food chain, they love to eat, you know, crustaceans, things that are right at the benthic surface, right? They're right on the bottom is that they tend to accumulate mercury. Um, and uh, we've had, we've sampled some adults that have had mercury loads that are high enough to suggest that that adult was, uh, being harmed by all the mercury in its body. And so um, that's a concern because mercury is a bioaccumulator. It doesn't go away. The more, the longer you live, the more of it you accumulate in your body. And so it could be something that may ultimately um, reduce the total lifespan of Goliath groupers. We might not see any more 30, 40, 50 year old fish anymore, just because they start to succumb to some of these, these issues that come with all that accumulation. So um, that's something to be, that's something that we're aware of and we're continually testing, um, but not really a disease uh, per se. Sure, thank you. Uh, Matthew mentions that in Goliath grouper diets, you've said that they are mostly comprised of non-sport fish. So snappers and other groupers. With depredation becoming an ever more present area of research, is it possible to use current and future diet data to see if depredation is changing the diet composition of these fish? Yeah, great question. So this is where kind of things kind of get can get tricky, right? Where if we look at the a very broad scale, right? We want to, if we want to say, I want to study the diet of a fish. I want to look at as many different fish as I can, right? Because that's going to tell me for this species, what is it eating? And when we do that, we find that in general, they like to eat crustaceans and then these kind of slow moving, kind of odd fish that they can, um, that they encounter um, in their environment. That being said, they, I also mentioned that they're opportunistic feeders. Opportunistic feeders mean that they tend to eat things that are easy to catch. Well, if you go out to an artificial reef and you start fishing and you catch a little mangrove snapper and it's too short and you let, let it down, you put it back into the water. Now, for a brief moment in time, the easiest thing for a Goliath grouper to eat is the injured gray snapper trying to get it back, trying to get back down to the bottom. And so that's where you get into this problem of depredation where it's predation by the fish, but it's altered by human activity, right? So <clears throat> I think both things are both things can be true at the same time. One that kind of in its in its more uh, typical state, Goliath groupers aren't eating a lot of grouper and snappers, but at the same time, they love high relief artificial reefs, which is where a lot of fishing activity takes place. 
And so you, they are implicated in a pretty large amount of depredation. People see this all the time where a Goliath grouper follows the fish up to the boat or they, they release a fish and they see a Goliath swim right over and, and eat the fish before it can get back down to the bottom. And that's, that's concerning as a fisherman. You don't want to, you know, you release the fish because it was too small for you to keep. Well, why should this, why should this Goliath get to eat it instead? Um, and so that's kind of something that doesn't really have any good answers. Um, in my opinion, it's not something that it's not a reason why we would want to go out and remove Goliath groupers or, or reduce the population. I think it's something that we're going to have to learn to live with to a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> remember that these are native species. They are supposed to be here and they're supposed to be here in numbers larger even than they are now. Um, we're supposed to have a lot more Goliath groupers in the water and our management has designed to increase the numbers of Goliath groupers um, because that's what an intact functioning ecosystem requires. So <clears throat> I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> I wish that there was some way that we could solve this problem. Um, but with Goliath groupers and now increasingly with sharks, I don't think it's something that we're going to, uh, it's not something that's going to be easy to solve and it's not going to go away anytime soon. To maybe address a little bit your question a little bit more specifically, we have not yet seen any evidence that those depredate, like that depredation is showing up in things like stable isotopes. Um, so stable isotopes kind of give us a much longer time series of what the fish is eating. Um, and it's actually, your question is actually getting at something that's important and it's why we should continue doing research over time as the population grows and maybe starts moving into places where it hasn't been for a long time. Um, you need to keep looking at that because we might see a signal there, right? There are ways for us to pick up if that diet is shifting. And that's really important to look at as the population changes over time. Because as soon if we were able to see that, which we haven't yet, it hasn't shown up in any of our analysis, but it could. And so we need to keep looking for it to kind of inform more of that, that depredation discussion. Thank you. And sort of a follow-up question to that one, Matthew's asking, could or would you expect to see a change in their diets based on this ever-present easy meal fishing bycatch? So... <laughs> Uh, it, this is something that uh, colleagues and I have talked about. Could we go and and maybe we could pair some of that acoustic telemetry with some kind of repeated um, repeated sampling of individuals? So if we know that there's certain individuals that love a specific reef that has a high level of depredation going on, maybe we could look at that individual specifically. We could use the acoustic telemetry to see how much it moved, to see exactly how much time it spent in that one place. And then we could look and say, okay, does do we see when we analyze this species muscles or its diet, do we see more of that effect? Um, I would say in terms of like a, as a scientist, that's a very, uh, I would classify that as a very high risk, low reward type of a study. Um, I think it's, you could think of ways to do it, but it would require probably a lot of time and money to get a very specific question um, and who knows, maybe that's going to, maybe as the depredation discussion keeps happening and, you know, uh, funding changes, maybe that's something that we could do in the future. It has not yet been something that, you know, would, would probably, it's not a study that would, would have been funded up to this point, but, uh, it could be in the future. Sure. Um, several folks are wondering what to do if they catch a Goliath grouper, either intentionally or unintentionally while fishing. And are there standard practices regarding venting? Yeah. So, um, I kind of spoke about it earlier. Basically, I would say if, if it's, if, if you're having a hard time lifting it up or it's, you know, bigger than your forearm, I would say, leave it in the water, um, try to get the hook out as fast as you can. 
Um, under, we also understand that these things are really cool. I love Goliath Groupers. I've been studying them since 2009, so 15 years now. And I still love seeing them whenever if I'm fishing or diving. So I absolutely get it. If you go out and you catch a big one, you want to take a picture of it. You want to jump in the water and swim around. Um, you know, as long as you are best practices say, you know, keep the fish wet if you can minimize how long you're holding it out of the water. If it's too big to get on your boat, don't even try. You know, if it's too big for you to lift up, don't don't try to pull it in over the gunnel or anything like that. Um, as far as venting goes, um, it's tough to descend a Goliath grouper using a descending device. Um, descending devices are generally better than venting. Um, uh, so for, maybe for those who aren't fishermen themselves, something that can happen to a fish as you bring it up from depth is, is something called barotrauma. So the air inside the swim bladder starts to expand and it can actually prevent the fish now from getting back down because it's too buoyant. Um, and so there's a few ways that we can, we can deal with that. One is called venting where you actually puncture the, the swim bladder, um, and then, uh, release the gas. And now the fish can swim back down, um, for smaller fish, um, something called a descending device, which is like an inverted hook, or, uh, there's a, a one called a sequelizer that will actually is, is like a, it's kind of like a lip gripper. Um, you can attach it to the fish's lip and then with a weight, put it back down. And when it gets to 50 or hundred feet, it will open up and release the fish and the fish can swim away. So these are things that help the fish get back down to depth. Um, <clears throat> Generally descending devices are better, but for a really big Goliath grouper, you need like a giant weight to, to sink it. So um, venting is often becomes the tool to use. Um, <clears throat> generally, if you lay the fish, if you if the fish is on its side at the surface and you push down the pectoral fin, go a little bit behind the edge of the pectoral fin. Um, and that's about where you can make a small puncture and then allow the gas to vent. Um, again, if you can descend it, that's preferable, but venting is, is also a tool to use. It's always better to get the fish down under back under the water to depth than leaving it floating at the surface. Thank you. We're going to begin to wrap up with just two more questions remaining. Our next one is from Rachel, who is curious how long the largest documented Goliath grouper was. Ooh, how long? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know offhand. Uh, I can tell you that the biggest one I ever caught was 226 centimeters, wow. um, which was around seven, a little over seven feet long. Um, not the world record for sure, but that was an enormous fish and that was a really fun day, uh, to sample that individual. Um, great question though. Now I want to look it up as soon as, as this is over. <laughs> All right, and we'll wrap up with um, one more where a couple of our members of our attendees today um, are curious if you always knew you wanted to study fish and if you have any advice for those who might be interested in careers similar to yours in the future. Um, <laughs> great question. I, I did always know I wanted to study fish. Um, I, my, I was obsessed, you know, how little kids love things like dinosaurs and trucks. I love sharks. Sharks were my jam. And, uh, I always grew up with, you know, books about sharks and posters of sharks on my wall. So that was really what I wanted to do. Um, and that informed where I went to school, right? Santa Barbara had a, had a great, uh, marine biology program. Um, that's where I wanted to go. As soon as I got to college, I made sure to take advantage of every opportunity that was offered. So I got dive certified. Um, as soon, you know, they had a, a regular open water dive certification that I did when I was a freshman. And then uh, I did as many dives as I needed to join the scientific diving program. So I got certified as a science diver. Um, and then I did an internship one summer i got to go to st croix for six weeks and and study fish with a grad student um and that pretty much cemented for me that that's that i wanted to do go be a research scientist um because you know we were just diving every day and looking at the reefs and 
looking at the fish and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and there's so many questions and it's, it's so cool to try to disentangle all these things that, um, yeah, kept me going until now. So I would say if it's, if it's something that you know what, that you want to do, just take advantage of all the opportunities that, that you can, um, either at school or look for them on your own. You, you can always find people like me, um, who do these sorts of things or, you know, you can write to FWRI and they'll help you find scientists to answer your questions. So. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to learn from you, speak to you and um, have the opportunity to hear more about your research. So again, we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Stephanie to begin to wrap up today's talk. Thanks, Brian, and thank you, Dr. Ellis, for the fascinating information on Goliath Grouper. I really also enjoyed the trajectory that took you there. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us again today for this great talk. If you'd like to take a look at the K-12 Extension resources related to today's topic, they're made available along with a recording of today's program at the UF Earth Systems YouTube channel. You can follow along uh, by visiting the uh, things you see here on the screen for scientists in every Florida school and the Anjari Foundation. Um, also, we are very excited to tell you that although today is our final of our spring series presentations through Ocean Expert Exchange, we will be back with a fall series ready and um, up and running shortly. So please stay tuned and we'll be sure to give you those updates. In the meantime, a huge thank you again to everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you on future Ocean Expert Exchanges. Take care. Bye-bye.